Genau. Good morning, this is Meg Riley in, yes, sunny Minneapolis where the floodwaters have finally seemed to be going by. It is scary though to be at the top of the Mississippi and have it be this wet. I'm really thinking of the people downstream. Yikes, but I'm, I'm thinking that it's over and thoughts and prayers with all the people affected by tornadoes and other really bad weather. It's, uh, it's been quite a week. Michael, how are you today? I'm doing okay. Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino in Peekskill, New York. Um, it's spring here, and I'm trying to get out in the garden more, and my body is resisting that with all of its joints. So that is what it is. Good morning, Asia Hauser on the West Coast. How are you? Hi, Michael Tino. Yes, I'm Asia Hauser. I'm in Seattle, Washington, and, and we have, um, it's intermittent spring. It's spring, then cold and rainy, then spring, and I'm on day 8,000. 423 in May. Um, so that's how I'm feeling. Reverend Don Fortune back in my home state of Jersey. Hey, I'm loving it here. It was up in like 80 yesterday in sunshine. Um, I'm going green and putting solar panels on the roof of my garage. Um, but I'm cheap, which means I have to do a bunch of the work before the guy gets here. So I'm spending my, my days off tearing um, asbestos shingles off the side of my garage. It's, you know, I'm living the dream. <laughs> Sorry, I skated in late. Who hasn't had a chance to talk this morning? We'll just bring in Margalie to tell us all about all right. what she's doing today. And Dawn, you seem to like that kind of stuff. I, 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 I do. Yeah. I, do. I, like <laughs> I fear for my house if I tried to do it. Margalie, tell us what you're doing today. Hello, good morning. I am again in Cromwell, Connecticut, where it's a little cloudy, which I love, and a little breezy. So you might hear my uh, wind chimes whenever I am on. So uh, of course, I'll be um, looking for your questions and comments on Facebook yeah, so I can post here for um, our wonderful panel of folks um, today. So, so glad you can join us. Back to you, Meg. So we're really excited to have a special guest today. But before we bring on the new president, Amidville Lombard, uh, we always kind of talk a little bit about what's up in UUism. And Aisha Hauser is always the person who knows the most. Aisha. <laughs> Sometimes when Christina's not here, I'm definitely the go-to. So first I have to give a huge congratulations shout out. I'm probably a couple of weeks late, so I pre-apologize. C.B. Beale is the 2019 Angus McLean Award winner for excellence in religious education. So I pass my gender neutral um, accoutrement that is worn on the head to her, to them, to them. I do that, to them. Uh, so I love you, C.B. Beale. Congratulations. Uh, really great, great award at, given to someone who's so amazing and prophetic. Came up with the phrase preemptive radical inclusion create your programs as if everyone you want to include is already there. And we want to include everyone, right? So CBBL, they are amazing. Woohoo! The other thing that happened this week where uh, Christina Rivera is, uh, she's flying out of today, is Denver for the UUMA sponsored the Unitarian Universalist Ministers, Ministers Association Ethics Summit on Joint Ethics Committee. I, I do not know the official name, but it's something about ethics and a joint committee. The UUA was there, Unitarian Universal Association, the Ministers Association, the administrators, the musicians, a representative from each congregational life staff. Um, religious educators. Lareda. <laughs> My people, uh, the religious, ed Lareda, the president, Lareda was there. So um, I checked in once uh, as, as part of the incoming Lareda board. And it sounds like there were some really uh, some some um, authentic and honest conversations uh, about pain that has been caused by people in power, ordained leadership, and naming what would it take, what would have what it would a joint ethics committee look like. So I wasn't there, and that's all I can say is that I know that this, um, and uh, I hope Christina Rivera maybe in the fall we can have a whole show on it. So that's all I know. I don't know if anybody else knows more yeah, on that's that. That's pretty great. Anyone else know anything? I know that Meadville just had their big graduation and summit and all of that. We'll hear a little bit more about that later. Uh, Don. Um, just as an aside for what it's worth, um, we've now lost the congregation I serve, the UU Congregation of the South Jersey Shore, has lost its fifth, sixth, 
seventh rainbow flag now. Um, and this time they took not only the big rainbow flag, which that's hung up there with 800, 800 pound test stuff. So they have to rip the flag off the grommets. So the grommets are still hanging there because 800 pounds. Anyway, um, that they took all our little flags um, and they vandalized our building. They, um, whoever it was, um, destroyed or removed um, some of our security cameras. So are you using that as an opportunity for media? Media is tired of it because we keep because it happens every couple of weeks. Except this is taking it to a new level. It sounds. I like. know. I know. We need. We want to get the. Um, we want to get the. Um, the security cameras back before yeah. we announce to the world that they were gone. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. You know. I mean, this is a pretty select audience that's that's going to be watching here today or watching yeah. online later. Um, but yeah, and our our the people in charge of such things are are all over it like paint now. It's just, it's it's the first time someone has attacked the building. Yeah, that's scary. You know, our, our building is back from the road. Um, our sign is out by the road, so it's kind of a target. Um, but to like, you have to turn the corner and go in the driveway and you know, it's a 150, 200 feet of driveway to get to the building, so. Plus ripping the flag off the grommets is, that took some uh, force. It, <sighs> You know, we're also right across the street from a college. Mm. So I'm thinking about my younger, stupider, less ethical days um, when I might have been tempted to steal something. And then to find that you can actually swing two or three people from it because I welded the bracket. I welded the bracket. Um, you know, it's inch and a third iron steam pipe holding it up there and set in with three inch lag screws. Truly 800 pounds. So at that point, it's kind of just fun, you know, to see what it takes to take it down. Um, and the flagpole stays, but I mean, we buy it, we buy the flags in bulk now. Yeah, that's what Joanna Crawford started doing. Boy, yeah. I, well, shout out to your people. It, yeah, it they're awesome. Like a, they're yeah, awesome. We here in, in uh, at the congregation I serve in Mount Kisco are about to put up our ninth set of Black Lives Matter banners. Um, so I, I hear you. Uh, and the congregation had our annual meeting on Sunday and we talked about this and people are angry and upset and determined to keep replacing it. And uh, someone asked, uh, does this happen to other congregations who hang up Black Lives Matter banners? And I said, absolutely every one of them that hasn't put it on their building so far up that nobody can touch it. And then those buildings get vandalized. Uh, I and think said, we're on our fourth or fifth, so yeah. Yeah, uh, and they were like, really everyone? I'm like, absolutely everyone that's on a road that you can see it from. I mean, they, yeah, there is probably some congregations where their building is so far away from the road and the banner is above the door. And so <laughs> it actually isn't very useful as public witness and they probably haven't had their stolen, but. Uh, yeah. I see that Shay, one of CLF's new learning fellows, is asking, do they have a ha hate crime statute where you are done? Is this covered under hate crime statutes? Um, yes, and it's um, before this time, it's been, you know, property damage of 15 bucks, right? Um, so now it's a little bit different because the cameras are expensive. Um, and so I've got budget people kind of cranky about that. They're like, but, but, but. Um, and the kicker was whoever took the cameras down had to use a ladder. They like had to, and it happened at like five o'clock on a Friday morning. Um, so I can extrapolate about what that means about who's doing it. Um, having once been a contractor who had to be out at five in the morning with a ladder in my truck. Um, but um, but yes, we have a hate crime statute, um, and the the chances of us actually catching someone, you have to have you have to have somebody to charge. You know, to to charge them with a hate crime, and if if we can, I mean, New Jersey's got great hate crime laws, um, but you know, you got to get somebody before you can 
before you can you can do that. I mean, they can investigate. I mean, they invest. What, what's there to investigate? Yep, flag's gone. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Gone. And and yeah. then if you do catch someone, and even if they if they're charged with a hate crime, you you enter the ethical arena of what does it mean to put people into the justice system? That's you know. As, I'm as not entirely know. worried about. I'm not entirely concerned about putting what I'm going to guess is a very fragile straight white man into the criminal justice system. I, I, I'm okay with that. I'm fine. Yeah. So we have Adam Sikowski saying that there we welcome refugee sign was taken so many times that the printer we used committed to replacing it free of charge. So this is happening to anybody who is expressing kindness, welcome, inclusion, and justice. And um, Oh, and Christina's watching <laughs> so, or for a minute. Christina, fly safe, and we will see you next week. Um, anyway, so congrats to everyone. This little suburban congregation I'm in part-time put a rainbow flag up. They're still trying to figure out the Black Lives Matter thing. That's scary to them. But they put the rainbow sign on top of the church. I mean, it is like 50 feet in the air. And I will say no one has bothered it, <laughs> nor have they vandalized the church. And it is very visible, but it literally is like up on top of the church. It's kind of odd. Anyway, you can see it from the highway. So let's move on with our guest, Michael Tino. We have kind of a longer introduction, but it was such a compelling one. I wanted to read the whole thing today, and we are so excited to welcome our guest today. Well, we are really glad to welcome Elias Ortega Aponte to our show. Um, Elias is an Afro-Latino scholar whose areas of expertise are cultural sociology, religious ethics, critical social theory, social movements, and bioethics. He received his PhD in religious social ethics from Princeton Theological Seminary, has served as associate professor of social theory and religious ethics at Drew University Theological School, and is now, and this is why we have him here, the president-elect of Meadville Lombard Theological School, one of our two uh, Unitarian Universalist theological schools. Um, Dr. Ortega Aponte uh, approaches teaching from an interdisciplinary perspective that is committed to social justice and the celebration of the creativity, genius, and fighting spirit of communities of color. His primary research interests are the study of intersections of race, religion, and the experiences of inequalities, uh, exp and uh, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to like read this here, uh, in Afro-diasporic communities in the United States and abroad, uh, how the experiences of inequalities lead Afro-diasporic communities in the United States and abroad to find ways to engage the challenges of urban poverty, incarceration, access to education, and adequate health care. That is a fabulous bio, and I'm so looking forward to getting to know you, Elias. Welcome to The View. Thank Wait, you. I would love to have you as the president of my seminary. <laughs> Wait, you are! <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have you as the president of my seminary and wait, you are that too. So there we go. <laughs> so that is a very exciting resume. And those are really amazing skills and passions and experiences that you bring in. So with all of that, where, where do you start? I know you've barely dipped your toe in yet, but mm -hmm. um, what are you most excited about? You're making a huge life change here. Yes, it is. It, it is a big shift. Um, it is a big shift. Um, and, I, and I'm excited to make that shift. And part of, uh, I would say, the central to that excitement for me is the opportunity to really serve our faith movement, right, in, in a different capacity. Um, and, and I think, you know, as educators in higher education, right, there's, um, there's always opportunities to do uh, new, new things and often some change institutions. And, and I will say that over the years, those things for me have not been particularly appealing just because I love the community with whom I'm working and the proximity of uh, not only colleagues in the area, but also uh, other service organizations that have been connected over the years have made it kind of hard to think about uh, leaving this place. Um, but I think for me, the opportunity to really to really serve our, our movement in that capacity of, of leadership uh, was central to that decision making process. Um, and I think it was also um, something of joy to, to be uh, called and selected um, just because of, of my 
unique set of, of expertise, but also identity within the movement, uh, meaning that um, I'm a lay leader, right? I, I am not, not ordained. Um, and, and that, and, and I'm also a religious educator, right? So that brings a different um, um, perspective uh, to the role, right? Um, and, and in some ways, the, the capacity to, to think uh, spaces within our movement, right? That um, folks like myself, even in this current capacity, uh, might not be welcome, right, to the table. Uh, so that's gonna be some, some interesting conversations um, coming up. Um, I would say from a more kind of personal standpoint, I'm, I'm also really excited to be in, uh, for the opportunity to be able to work in Chicago, right? I think um, given, given the, the areas of interest in my own research and work, uh, thinking about education, incarceration, policing and health in Chicago is, um, is central, right, to, uh, to the work that I'm gonna be doing. And, and I'm looking forward to, the, to thinking about ways to uh, bring Meadville into closer partnership, right, to community members and community organizations. Um, in the kind of larger Chicago area and also the larger UU world. That is so exciting in this time. I mean, I think of the uh, CTS, the Chicago Theological School, which has been doing really wonderful work in some of these intersections and has great leadership and, and some of the collaborative moments that we're in um, and also the Obama Center, of course, right there. Um, so what, what um, in this moment, these skills that you have seem so central to what is needed in this country. How do you see that coming into the people who come to the school, what, what you bring? Um, you know, um, let me make a, a quick connection there. Um, I'm really excited to, to the opportunity to network with CTS. Uh, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Ray, who is their uh, current president, has been a mentor and a friend um, over the years. Um, and he was instrumental for me in thinking through what does the shift might, might mean, uh, not only for me personally, right, but also uh, as an educator um, at large. And, and, and I think uh, to, to answer then, then your question, uh, that I think the opportunity for, for us to think um, will be to think more deeply about social justice work as part of faith formation. Right? And I think in, in my experience and in my work uh, among us UUs, uh, one of the things that I'm becoming deeply aware uh, is that even though we have an ethos of social justice, right, uh, as our ethos, uh, the way that that oftentimes manifests itself in creation or life uh, is that we have people who are very passionate about something uh, and a particular cause, and they're committed to it. Uh, we do not get in, in their way. We support them in doing the work, but it's oftentimes not ingrained as part of our, the fabric, right, of, of our faith life, right, is, so-and-so project and we own it in the sense that we don't get in the way and we support it, uh, but it's not part of our uh, faith practice. We don't have particularly rituals, shall we say, uh, that make that uh, central to our work, right? We don't set aside uh, that moment, kind of the ongoing moment of uh, what does it look like to our faith uh, rhythm in our community uh, to make this social justice work part of what we do in terms of reflection. Right, um, and the moments in which that happens, I think the response has oftentimes been one of concern, right? Or we're becoming too political and not spiritual enough. Um, and I think that there might be something, something to that because we don't do it uh, in a way that is part of the work that we do in terms of faith. Uh, so that, that that is something that I'm really looking forward to engaging more more deeply, right, with our with our folks, staff, and faculty members and students, right, in the area. Um, and 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 I think one of the things that that may mean for us. Uh, as a movement is to really take religion and spirituality seriously uh, in, a, in a collective sense. But I think we, um, one of the things that, that I've noticed in our movement uh, is that since the 70s, um, a lot of our theological thinking has been individualized in terms of my experience, right? Or sort of my reflections of, of a particular topic, right? So a lot of the theological work that we have been doing is individual. Right. Uh, it's not um, more kind of systematic or, or vision casting. Um, and that has something to do with our anti-dogmatism, right? that we want to push um, against that uh, in terms of doctrine. Uh, but I think it has not served our movement well, right? because we don't have uh, a lot of things against which to kind of hone our thinking right? Right? And, our, and our practices uh, beyond the individual right, experience. 
uh, that direct experience and we have a firm right and, and i'm a firm believer uh, of that but i think communally we need to start uh developing practices that engage us collectively right in in this faith work and to be honest not not be uh, apologetic about being a, a religion and a faith tradition um right it's um in some ways becoming um i don't want to say necessarily missionaries but be evangelistic about our faith right uh, just don't be shy about it. <laughs> yeah. Can I name um, three things? You're on the Commission on Institutional Change. You've served on the Religious Education Credentialing Committee, and you are one of the most amazing knitters I've ever seen. You make so uh, yeah. So we just need to name the total. I mean, already the resume is like what? But then you've also so I think a lot. It would be helpful to hear how much you've learned on the commission. Um, and what you, the Commission on Institutional Change, which you've been on since the beginning. Um, and I'm not sure, actually, are you going to continue on that? And then how that's informed how you will um, lead Meadville? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that the ongoing conversation about my, let me do the easy question first. Um, I think we are in, in a sermon process of whether I'm going to be continuing the commission or not. And some of that uh, has to do, of course, with uh, the kind of, particularly this first year, uh, the kind of time commitment that it would take to uh, both be in the commission and be uh, part of, uh, of an institution, lead an institution. Um, and I think that the other part of that question, um, or that answer also has to do about uh, boundaries, right, in, in some ways, and um, what can I be privy of or not given my, my new role? Right, and I think uh, that that's something that I'm considering um, seriously. Right, let's say if it was the case that we have uh, a representative from our sister school as well, uh, right? I think the conversation might be a little different um, for me, right? Uh, in in that sense. Um, on the other hand, uh, right, part of the commission work from the beginning, uh, the the goal would be to create the archive that we create will be placed in Midvale, uh, Lombard, right, in, in the Sankofa archives. So uh, I think in, in that way, my, my work will continue, uh, right, with, with the commission work uh, to make that a reality. One of the things that I have committed though, uh, whether I, I continue the commission or not, would be to um, continue to, to work in some of the, our writing and, and reporting, which I've been uh, really engaged in, um, and I think will be important for me to continue. So as I think some of you may know, um, I'm kind of the one at the moment responsible to uh, go through the data that we have collected in testimonies, um, right, and the like, which is, um, I don't want to say that is surprising, uh, right, because I think we, we know what is happening, uh, but it still is painful. Um, in, in some of the larger learnings, I think for me, that I have uh, come really aware in the commission work um, is that we have as a movement, we have kind of engaged and sputtered uh, right, fits and, and, and fits this this uh, conversation of race, um, and and we have some really interesting um, moments that have been uh, kind of calls to public actions, but we haven't done much with it. So one of the things that I that I have become really aware, uh, for example, the language of institutional change is not a, it's, oh, institutional racism. It's not new, right, to our work. It, it was already used in other uh, GAs, and we have. Um, Actions of immediate witness are actually called for engaged institutional racism from, from the 90s, um, right? And so that I was not particularly aware of. So going back through some of those GA resolutions, right, and, and uh, other documents have been for me very informative, right? Because uh, in some ways the analysis have been there, uh, right? Uh, we just have not gotten serious about doing the work, right, to, to dismantle our own structures to make that a reality. Uh, which I find uh, eye-opening, uh, right, but also troublesome. Why has it taken us so long, right, to do to do this engagement, right? Um, and I'm thinking that the faith of our movement could be so different if we have been more serious about that engagement, right? Not only the folks that we have that we have lost and hurt, uh, but also those that have not joined us, right, because they know our our shortcomings. Um, I think that those that might be the, the kind of the main learning right that I that I have derived from from this work in the commission. Um, I also one of the things that I'm deeply concerned about, and, and I think in, in the moment um, it's not the time to address it, but uh, at some point we also have to get serious about uh, um, the ways in which you know POC folks also internalize racism and the way that we uh, weaponize that against others. Um, either as a career opportunity or just because. 
um, that is that is a, a longer conversation, right? But I think it's also a conversation that is that is part of this um, as well. Uh, May I jump in for a minute? I just yeah. wanted to say, having lived through that history in the '90s and been part of it, as many probably people watching have been, and Michael, I know you were there for a bunch of it. Um, exactly what happened with that is exactly what's happening now, which which is that white people said, oh, I agree with the idea, but I don't like this reference. I don't like this model. Now they're saying, I don't, I, of course I agree. I just don't like the language of white supremacy. If you, it's all about the language. It's all about the methodology. It's all, it's not about not being for it, you know? And I just wonder if you have any, uh, anything to say about that. Cause I, for one, I'm pretty bored by it, but that's what I see happening again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I see it- I uh, thought you might have some wisdom from all of your readings and scholarship, <laughs> besides that it's just repetitive, tedious, and oppressive. You know, and I think part of the challenge is that some of this conversation is really uh, developmental uh, conversations, right? And, and some folks are at, at different capacities and levels to, to work, uh, to do the work. Uh, but it also means that the burning, right, the burning of learning is, is, is a lifelong process. It's not a burden, it's a joy. But for some folks, it's really hard work. And, and how do we move some folks? Uh, I think, how do we minimize the harm that folks uh, who are in those kind of beginning level of awareness uh, uh, to move in that continuum uh, is it, part of the challenge, right? And, and I think particularly in our movement, um, I need to say this carefully, but we, we like to give space for everybody equally in, in, in some in some ways. And when when some folks uh, become in some ways fragile, we can over prioritize some of those conversations uh, with a number of people. And some of it is because we are un uncomfortable with conflict and we do not know how to stay in the room when, when things get uncomfortable. Uh, another is a reality that folks weaponize their givings, uh, whether to institutions or congregations. Uh, and then that, that's a concern. Um, right for folks. So we, we tend to kind of, uh, instead of kind of bubble wrapping folks or giving them a timeout uh, to have that conversation, um, we tend to just amplify their, their voices in ways that is destructive uh, right to the movement as a whole. Um, and, and I think what, what it would take for us is to be willing to have some of those difficult conversations uh, with, with folks and, and understanding that some, some folks might have to leave for a while, right? Uh, some of our spaces, right? given the, the the danger, right, that their views can can cause, uh, but also not understanding that this is not a rejection of them as an individual personally, but it's a rejection of their unwillingness to to grow. And, and I think, right, it, it, it's part of spiritual practice, right? Can you be spiritually mature enough to actually understand this is an area of, that you need to grow, right? Um, and folks. I think some folks are not are not there. Uh, they're not willing to go there. Um, and, and I will say this is not unlike um, what I what I have seen over the years um, in our inability to take faith seriously. Right. Uh, I, I will say, and I say this with with respect. One of my biggest concern at times is how some of our members jump into build your own theology, right, without a, a really kind of complex understanding of, of the movement itself. Um, and what that has done for many folks is kind of ingrained the view that you can believe whatever the hell you want uh, and be part of this movement. And it's like, well, not quite, right? Not quite. We have some shared commitments and values that you have to operate. And we also have a faith and a tradition uh, that has historical roots uh, that we need to, to engage. Not as a matter of dogma, right? But as a matter of uh, complex understanding of where we come from, uh, to know where we're going. And I think it's, it's problematic. So for, for me, those two things go hand in hand, right? If we have folks who are willing to grow uh, spiritually and do the, the, the work necessarily, we also have folks who will be willing to grow uh, and understand the complexity of, of the legacy of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia in this nation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. People are, uh, hosts are talking to each other here. Why don't you, Isha, why don't you <laughs> say that to everyone? So Kiana Perkins, who's the social justice director at Ann Arbor, talks about um, you use loving language battles and word warriors are hard. So my response to her is that when we argue about words, then we don't have to take action and really dismantle the oppressive systems. And I want to name something about Unitarian Universalists. And um, 
So we have, um, we can, when we put our minds to something, marriage equality, and actually babies and bailouts, more mothers were bailed out this year than ever. So I don't want to overinflate our influence, but we, we have the capability and the potential to have an influence, even though we're maybe small in number. So wouldn't it be great if we stopped arguing about words and actually um, took that energy into resisting action to actually, to putting it to, to, to <laughs> I'm now to doing something. And I don't, and I, I think the something is what stumbles people because it's like, and this is the white supremacy culture chart. Oh, but that something has to be perfect. Now I will say, have that something be informed. Don't do harm to POC. Take the lead. You be, when a POC is leading, listen to that person. You don't need to be the white savior. And so I think what would be helpful for me to understand is I know, I think Meadville a couple of years ago, we, we had heard of Meadville's initiative to be more, to join the community and have the seminarians um, be much more in tune with community ministry, whether or not they go into it. Um, how do you, what do you envision in terms of, oh, you said a little bit about Chicago and what does it look like even for our congregations and, and the kind of um, seminarians you want to inspire and inform? Yeah, I mean, that's a question that I have a lot of feelings about. <laughs> and, and some of my feelings uh, around that uh, is, um, okay, let me put it this way. Um, I think in, in some ways our congregations uh, and, and our movement do not really consider, even though we talk uh, and we empower ministers at some point in their career, we oftentimes do not support the formation into ministry as we could. Right, and and that that entails um, not only the process of congregational life, right, but also the support. How do we uh, support, uh, resource, and empower our seminarians through other studies, right? That's something that happens, kind of in, in some ways, is Jesus going into the desert, right? You go by yourself instead of forty days. You go forty years, three years, whatever, into the desert by yourself. Um, you know, you figure it out how to pay for it, how to get there how to study, uh, how to maintain a spiritually vital life. Uh, and then you show up to the MFC, you get enthroned or you get your wand and then you come out into ministry. Uh, and then as a movement, we accept you as being, you know, fully prepared for that. Um, I don't like that model, right? I really, I really don't. Um, I think it's important for our congregations to really take responsibility and charge, uh, right, to support our, our, our ministers, whether they're, they are from your congregation or not, right? That for me, that's beside the point. But how do we support, right, religious professionals at all different levels, right, in a way that we understand this is for the future, for the present and the future of our movement. This is the sustainability. Uh, and that also includes, for, at least from my perspective, uh, the, the way that I'm seeing things, right? The next generation of religious leadership is right now in middle school and high school, uh, right? So we need to start cultivating those folks now, right? In order to have that pipeline uh, ready and robust, right? That people understand that, that calling, right? And that vocation. And I don't think we do that well enough. Um, and, and I also think that we need to be, uh, and I think thinking for Midbo as an institution, um, one of the challenges of theological education generally uh, is um, that we are talking about folks who are uh, coming as second career students, right? Who also have other commitments in terms of, of life, family, and employment. Um, and I think as we develop different models of education, we're still in those processes that uh, even though some of the expectation is that the models are not residential, uh, they still expect a level of academic formation that is primarily residential. Right, um, and that creates some 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 challenges. Right, I think from from, from a student perspective, um, because you may or may not have the resources right to do that, or you um, also have other competing responsibilities. Right, that prevents you from kind of focusing full time on your studies, and you have to do it part time, uh, and that creates other challenges. Right, or something as simple as access to to libraries, right, or resources. Um, can be a challenge. Um, and from my, from my perspective, I mean, those can be things that congregations can can help, right? They might not be able to give you a scholarship, but they might be able to buy your books for the semester, right? They're supporting you, right? And as a student, uh, that would have been a big help, <laughs> right? Somebody did that. Or somebody played my, my, my flight ticket, right? To go the three times I have to go to Meadville, uh, right? Uh, in, in some ways, those are kind of low, uh, low stake ask, 
right, that I think folks can contribute um, in, in a way to really empower and support uh, our leadership. Um, and I think connecting with a larger community, right, whether in Chicago or elsewhere, uh, really requires taking accountability seriously, right, with our partners and who our partners are. Um, developing those relationships really take, take years um, and, and it's, it's intentional. Um, part of my concern, and again, not, not, I'm still learning, right, the, the media in Meadville, but in the institution that I've been part of is at times some of those events are not, are tend to be one and done, right? They're not ongoing partnership. Um, and at some point, um, what ends up happening is that we overuse, right, our partners to resource our, our students, right, um, in our development, uh, but not to their, to their benefit, um, right? Um, and, and that is not helpful. Or uh, my, my <laughs> our social justice committee processes of just, you know, giving $100 to 10 institutions, right, or 20 institutions, instead of just putting that pocket of money into one institution and make a big difference, uh, right? So, so my hope then would be in this process of developing partner, partners in, in the community is to, to be really intentional about where are we gonna focus our energy uh, to understand that we cannot do, do anything, like everything. Right. We might be have maybe one or two kind of flagship uh, issues that we work in. Right? So I'm thinking Chicago public education is, is a big struggle, right? The same thing as food, right? It's another big struggle. Uh, you can think about environmentalism, racism, sexism, all the issues um, in any of those big topics, um, right? And those will be ways to involve right, our, our students in a way that creates larger learning. I also think that it's really important for institutions to be informed by what's happening at a congregational level. Uh, there's a big, big disconnect, uh, right, I think, from, from those things. Um, and, and some of that is very basic skills, like how do you run a meeting, uh, right? <laughs> or how, how do you read a budget? Um, and, and I think in my, my sense in seminary in theological education is that we have not found a way to understand those things as part of your faith formation. Right or theological values, which I think I think that's that, huge. I just need to say thank you, Doctor Elias Apante Ortega, because oh my God, how? how thank you. That's what I'm gonna say. The budget, Reverend Don, that that's important, and actually understanding what a nonprofit budget is, uh, right? Because it's different than a regular budget. It has some really funky quirks. <laughs> I wondered if Margalee, since we have a student here, uh, if you were resonating with uh, what your new president said, not to put you on the spot speaking truths of power, but you know, <laughs> I thought that his description to me fit the students I know, but I, since we have a student here. <laughs> sure, go ahead and, oops, go ahead and put me on the spot. I was just wondering if I thought, you know, I have a tendency of leaving my mic um, off. So I wanted to make sure but yeah, I was listening uh, to what you were saying about us coming in as second, third, fourth career students. That is so true. And then the financial hardship um, coming in and, you know, it's like you start getting older and you're thinking, wait, I'm going to take student loans. And then the weight of that on you when you uh, get out um, to be able to um, pay for those. I do love the idea of really... Um, um, engaging us with the community. Who knows? Maybe uh, um, the housing part, uh, folks in the community could could um, house us, which would be so helpful to just engaging, you know, and then the relationships that are formed as a result of that. So um, I, I, I'm liking that vision. Of course, by the time it's all in place, I'll, I'll be um, gone. And the, the idea of also students um, just being able to the administrative part of um, <laughs> of ministry. Uh, that is, you know, um, this is my second career and I worked as an administrator before. So I come in with a lot of experience in that area, but I think it is true. You have um, folks coming out of um, seminary focusing on theology and um, um, other aspects of congregational life. And then here you are with, uh, brand new spanking ministry position and you're running things and uh, yes okay uh, maybe the theology you have some, uh, some sort of a handle on but yes there is so much more to it and I, I do like um, the idea of just kind of like 
making sure that all of that is taken care of. It's not just mm -hmm. um, theology or um, spirituality that's involved. And, and not only that, all of that is spirituality, right? Um, the, um, the administrative part and all of the other part, that's, um, that's also ministry. So yeah, I am, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just enjoying listening to what, uh, to all the things you're saying. So if you can get that housing thing, <laughs> I, I think what resonated the most was your sense of the isolation of each individual and how that perpetuates the individualism that we've been lifting up as part of the real theological problem with looking at our power collectively and looking at what we could actually be and do. Mm -hmm. So I love the way you're connecting the very practical with the very theoretical. I, I think it's profound and I, I we're getting lots of fan mail from viewers just saying how excited they are about your presidency and I, I just want to echo that it's also here in the panel I think Asia just maybe bounced off the ceiling <laughs> and you know I will say um, I'm a graduate an alum of the Meadville Lombard uh, what used to be the modified residency program mm -hmm. which has become the curriculum at, at Meadville Lombard and um I asked the congregation that I was a member of and working 10 hours a week as part of, like for free, working 10 hours a week uh, as part of the, the, the Meadville curriculum um, for, for assistance with seminary costs. And they told me, no, thank you. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that, uh, that, that pushing our congregations in that way is, uh, is really, really important. Um, I, because Asia is really excited that you're going to teach ministers how to make a budget, I want to ask about religious education. Um, <laughs> so uh, one of the things that drew me to Meadville Lombard in 2000, when I started seminary, was the, the fact that the program that I was applying to was designed to, uh, to educate religious educators. Um, to actually train religious educators who wanted to be ministers of religious education. And that, that Meadville was the center that we had, whatever, mm. um, however it was at that point for religious education work and, and has only deepened that with the, the FAS collaborative uh, being housed there in the FAS archives and, and all that. And I'm wondering, given that you have a background as a religious educator, if there are things that you hope to draw on or strengthen mm -hmm. uh, at Meadville in that in that area or from that area, yes, I mean there there's there so much. I mean, um, um, I need to say start first that you know when when I think about ministry, I think about ministry comprehensively, right? I think there's um, no area in in my own work um, that I don't think about in terms of ministry, right? I'm a little late coach. And even as I'm doing that, I'm thinking about, in some ways, I'm not talking to the case about religion, but in some ways I'm modeling particular ways of, of behaving and acting on values that are informed, right, for my, from my uh, faith formation, right, for my, for my beliefs. And I need to be really intentional, right, about, about that, even modeling that. Um, I think uh, in terms of what we can do, what I will envision, right, in, in some ways, meaningful to be, um, it would be, you know, let's say if uh, I have unlimited access to resources, right, and uh, I can tap in, you know, uh, human assets as, as, as freely um, as, as possible, right? So, you know, work without lim those uh, really specific limitations. Um, I think, you know, one of the contributions that theological schools can do to, to the movement as a whole is to be really engaged in uh, in, in some ways, I want to call it both uh, a model of capacitation uh, leaders that are also being informed by it, right? So um, I don't think we might be able to kind of reach, right, let's say, all the RV programs, right, in, in our denomination, but we could be intentional to developing uh, connections to kind of regional leaders, right? So work with those particular leaders or influencers to influence their own particular context. Uh, and in, in, in doing that also becoming informed, right? But what's going regionally, because working in, in rural, right? Uh, Washington is very different than working in, in New Jersey, uh, right? In fact, working in, in Northern Jersey as an RE is very different than working in Southern Jersey as an RE. 
uh, right? Because New Jersey is that funky of a state uh, in, in, some, in some very unique ways. Um, but but I think that would be important, right, to do that. I think um, the limited resources, I would love to do a digital project, right, in which a lot of our archival materials and resources are made publicly and accessible, right, for, for, for research and learning outside of, of Midfield. So you don't have to come. And I know some of that is happening already, um, but I think it would be important to to kind of expedite that process uh, and, and and not only have it just as, as a thing that is open, um, but also have learning content included so with evergreen content. Um, one of the things that, that I'm always struck in our denomination is, uh, let's say, if you think about uh, the evangelicals, for example, uh, the publishing houses are, are churning curriculum all the time, uh, right, all the time, uh, and not only curriculum, but also outreach materials. Um, we we don't do that right as as, as often we don't um, and I think that that is that hurt us right I think our process to being able to to bring folks together and create uh, and renew materials is really really important um, and do that effectively right in in collaboration not only with you know with faculty and staff but also active educators in the community right the active DREs is really important. Um, I was having a conversation about how folks talk about uh, what peer review is and what does it count, because there, there's a presupposition that you know higher education academics go through this really intense peer review process, and some of that is true. But oftentimes peer review means that you know whatever I write, uh, two or three people of my colleagues in in the field will read it and give me feedback. Right, I sharpen that and then it goes public. Uh, but those of you who, who create curriculum know that's not how it works, right? In your curriculum work, uh, you talk to a lot of people, right? You feel tested, you draw it again, you do it, you feel tested again, right? You bring other people involved. So in some ways, the, the kind of peer review that cur curriculum goes through is a lot more intense, uh, right, than a peer review essay, uh, except that we don't talk about it that way, right? We don't take it with the same seriousness that I think, right, we, we should. We should do that. So that, that, that would be one aspect that I would love to see, right, our Midville Lombard involved in, right? How do we work with, right, uh, the UA and the pay formation staff, uh, uh, you know, the RACC and others to, to really kind of, you know, re-envision what our curriculum looks like. I'd also, I think, would be important to, to find uh, ways of access for lay folks who just want to do continue ed um, without having to do a full degree. I think that would be important um, under my leadership, but that's something that I, that I believe. And I would say, I grew up, I grew up in Acosto. Um, and one of the things that I was always impressed uh, with in Acosto is how people who do Bible in institutes take them very seriously, even if they're not I, I, accredited. And you have folks who work full time and then find a space to go, you know, two, three times a night to a Bible institute. Um, and these folks take this very, very seriously, right, as lay leaders. Um, and I think for us, that would be important to develop uh, a tradition of that, of, of ongoing learning, right, as part of the, the journey. I, uh, I wanted to go back to the financial thing. Um, Michael said something about it, and um, Dawn, you, you just commented on it again in the um, box here, or maybe it's Aisha. But the thing is, I think it has to be part of the culture. Um, and I don't necessarily mean just the midfield culture, but UU congregational culture, UUA, that um, the seminarian, this, it is a financial hardship and that it is an understanding, uh, there should at least be an understanding that if a congregation is able to provide financial support and that they should, you know, there, I think it shouldn't be, as Michael mentioned, him having to go and beg for money and then still get told no. But if, if there's an understanding that, oh, you know what? Um, that, that is part of, of, of the work that we're doing. That is part of the work we're doing, um, training folks into the um, leadership of our movement. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think a culture like that needs to be developed. And it sounds like that's one of the things you will be looking to do, connecting with um, congregations and so on, so that some, a culture like that Mm -hmm. can, uh, can come about. Is that, am I right or? Um, yes, and, and I think not only congregations, but I think outside uh, other partners as well. You know, I think um, one of the things that, um, give, given the state of, of congregational life in general, um, uh, uh, 
MD degree have to be more flexible than just, um, let me put it differently, it has to have transferable skills, right? Um, that you can work in other, in other sectors outside of a, of, of a parish setting, uh, whether it's nonprofit management, uh, right? Public service and other capacities. Um, and I think that requires not only tweaking the education, right? To say, uh, how can you translate what you're doing into other contexts, but also developing a pipeline um, of engagement with other type of organization. Um, and I think, uh, I wonder what would it look like? And at the moment, I, I, I'm this is a, a kind of a design problem that I'm really curious about, uh, is that what would it look like to have um, kind of for-profit sponsors of students, right? What would that look like? Uh, to say you're invested in a student as part of your moral officer or your ethics board or, or you know, something along those lines, um, understanding that a lot of our students already have prior professional experience and background that I think oftentimes they feel compelled to kind of push aside and not mobilize again uh, in order to pursue a, a ministerial calling or whatever whatever shape or form that takes. Uh, but instead, how do we build, right? How do we layer on top of that professional experience uh, another level of religious leadership to then do some other uh, kind of work? Um, and I, th I just wonder what would it look like uh, to, to do that, right? To be in that kind of partnership. And I think it will also be beneficial, right, for uh, the institution itself to be affiliated with folks who have other level of skills and also fundraising. Right? I think fundraising, we have been so limited to uh, internal to the movement and congregational settings. Uh, our big donors are aging, um, right? And they, now we need to develop right, new lines of communication um, with, with funds that are going to be outside right, of, of UU spaces. Um, I also think uh, some of that work is also important to create larger networks of, of employment, right? What are the possibilities uh, for folk to move outside of careers? Because um, as our congregational dwindles, uh, it, it will be more than likely that many folks are, are kind of bivocational, right? Uh, ministering is the thing that you do on the side, right? Uh, uh, Part-time, but you have to have a, a larger profession. And, and, and I think being, we've been too coy about having that conversation. Um, and that's, that's been a true conversation since the 80s, um, right? And we're just being really coy about it. I think we need to be more upfront um, about that, that conversation. Um, I also think that one of the challenges that this, this will come up uh, is a distinction between equity and fairness, uh, right? And I think one of the ways in which we do financial aid and support oftentimes is a matter of fairness, right? That, that in some way, everybody gets the same thing. Um, and I wonder, what would it say for us to move in, in a more robust equity model to understand that it might be important to support some folks more right than others in terms of capacity right financial capacity and make it possible for them um, as a justice move um, right i think that that's going to take some really intentional work um, around that and some difficult conversations um, around that but but it's important conversation to have and and, and i say you know uh, I was somebody that I was fortunate enough to have uh, what many think kind of the, the very nice financial package for uh, MDF and grad school. And still, right, I had to work full time, right, to make it possible. Um, because even though, you know, my, my schooling was covered, um, right, and I did get stipend that helped to pay to defray the cost of housing, right, and medical expenses, I still have to eat, <laughs> right, and do all the stuff. So I still have to work, right. Uh, so I, I think there's other ways uh, that we could envision and think collectively to make that, make that a possibility. Lots of comments um, from viewers talking, uh, support for the lay leadership idea, lay leaders talking about how they could use more skills. Um, and I know that's an idea that's, I've heard my entire time in UUism, it seems like, is it, the Society for Larger Ministry, somebody's moving with it. I'm, and I'm, Asia, I'm looking to you because you always know these things, or Don, somebody's moving with it. And I'm really excited moving to with, see that. Um, the idea of, of lay leadership training in a structured way. I thought it was Meadville that has a whole certification. And oh, and the uh, it's either Surge, one of the two regions that aren't on this coast, um, that are on the east and middle. <laughs> are doing like a lay certification um, and much more empowering of lay leadership, which I think is so crucial and exciting. You know, um, I think some of those issues I'm thinking um, sort of my, one, one of my work, I have been connected to the Episcopal Church for, for a while. 
And one of the things that they have that we don't we don't have, right? Because we don't have very designated rights or very strong kind of theological views on a number of things, uh, is that we have no, no ways to kind of hold each other accountable to those leadership. So I'm thinking, if you are an Episcopalian, the theology of baptism uh, really means that you're going to be working in on all different levels. Like you are part of the the group of the priesthood, right? In some capacity, and you have a responsibility for for ministry. Right, not only we give him, but times and resources as well. Um, we don't, we don't have anything articulated along those lines. Like that takes you, takes you there uh, in a way that can hold us accountable. Right, it's more if you somewhat feel like it <laughs> and you're passionate and you get involved. But, but I think we need to be more intentional as a faith community to really, really engage those conversations. Um, and I think that will also empower. Uh, some of our structures uh, to to rethink ourselves differently. Um, I reached not too long ago. I was in a, in a fellowship um, that was a rather robust fellowship with no minister, uh, right? And it's been going on for over forty years, from what I understand. And once they figured out who it was, the conversation became it's like, well, we want to grow a little bit more to have a minister. And I was wondering, it's like, and I posed the question, it's like, and by the way, this is not against ministers. Right, but I was wondering what, what was the push behind it, that they feel they have a thriving congregation, uh, they build a new building, they have outreach, right? everything is laid laid. And the push is that we need to have a minister. And it's like, well, what, what exactly for you, need, you think you need a minister? Uh, right? Is it a matter of you need somebody to do pastoral care? Right? Is it a matter of outreach? Uh, is it just because you need a minister so you can just lay back and do anything? Right? Not that, but you know, not play the role that you're playing. Uh, what what is it, right? What do you think that minister calling us a minister will will do in your congregational setting? And you know they didn't have a clear answer. They just wanted a minister because that's what congregations do. You get to a particular size, you have the funds, and you hire a minister. Uh, for me, that was so. I don't want to say silly, right? But I was I was kind of shocked, right, by the meaning to conform. And you know I was expecting something along the lines of we need somebody to do pastoral care. Right. And, and I think entering into a settled minister ministry um, with somebody to do pastoral care is different than somebody doing a settled minister for become more kind of the CEO operation of your congregation, right? Those are two different contracts and that's two different views of, of ministry that, um, and it's possible, it's feasible, right? But I just thought it was not, not quite there. Well, perhaps that ties back to not knowing who we are spiritually, that if we don't have a building and a minister, we don't know how to recognize that we're a church. At least that is an observation I have from being out in the world. So <laughs> we have really enjoyed this and look forward to seeing um, you actually move to Chicago and take it up. And we'd love to be of support and to have you back. It's a great conversation. Um, next week, we have some folks Meg Richardson, Teresa Ines Soto, and Bethany Fox talking about welcoming children, youth, and adults with special needs. And any final words? I'm so freaking excited. I really am, Elias. First of all, because I love you as a person and you knit, I need to say that again, you make socks and amazing things and you are just so open-hearted and brilliant and I, I adore you and I'm so excited for you. Thank you. That's a nice benediction. All right, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much. It's really, really.